Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So today I'm going to be covering the ninth tendency or bias in Charlie Munger's Psychology of Human Misjudgment series. This is from the book Poor Charlie's Almanac. Now, reciprocation tendency is actually what got me interested in doing this series in the first place. Uh, and I really heard from Monish Pabrai how he uses reciprocation tendency. Basically, he sends potential clients, partners of Pabrai funds, a $50 pen. And in exchange, many of them become partners in Pabrai funds, contributing millions of dollars. Okay, so an incredibly powerful tendency here. I'm going to start by reading some excerpts from Poor Charlie's Almanac. We're going to see what Chat GPT has to say on the topic. And then we're probably going to end here on the Farnham Street blog post on reciprocation bias to really dig into some examples. So starting in Poor Charlie's Almanac. Reciprocation tendency. The automatic tendency of humans to reciprocate both favors and disfavors has long been noticed as extreme as it is in apes, monkeys, dogs, and many less cognitively gifted animals. The tendency clearly facilitates group cooperation for the benefit of members. In this respect, it mimics much genetic programming of the social insects. We see the extreme power of the tendency to reciprocate disfavors in some wars wherein it increases hatred to a level causing very brutal conduct. For long stretches in many wars, no prisoners were taken, the only acceptable enemy being a dead one. And sometimes that was not enough, as in the case of Genghis Khan, who was not satisfied with corpses. He insisted on their being hacked into pieces. Whew. One interesting mental exercise is to compare Genghis Khan, who exercised extreme lethal hostility toward other men, with ants that display extreme lethal hostility toward members of their own species that are not part of their breeding colony. Uh, Genghis looks sweetly lovable when compared to the ants. The ants are more disposed to fight and fight with more extreme cruelty. Indeed, E.O. Wilson once waggishly suggested that if ants were suddenly to get atom bombs, all ants would be dead within 18 hours. What both human and ant history suggest is, one, that nature has no general algorithm making intraspecies, turn-the-other-cheek behavior a booster of species survival. Two, that it is not clear that a country would have good prospects were it to abandon all reciprocate disfavor tendency directed at outsiders. And three, if turn-the-other-cheek behavior is a good idea for a country as it deals with outsiders, man's culture is going to have a lot of heavy lifting because his genes won't be of much help. So just to say, we're, we're very wired to reciprocate, both positively and negatively. I next turn to man's reciprocated hostility that falls well short of war. So this is outside of war scenarios. Peacetime hostility can be pretty extreme, as in many modern cases of road rage, or injury-producing temper tantrums on athletic fields. The standard antidote to one's overactive hostility is to train oneself to defer reaction. As my smart friend Tom Murphy so frequently says, you can always tell the man off tomorrow if it is such a good idea. Okay, a little patience, that's, that's the antidote here. Of course, the tendency to reciprocate favor for favor is also very intense, so much so that it occasionally reverses the course of reciprocated hostility. Weird pauses in fighting have sometimes occurred right in the middle of wars, triggered by some minor courtesy or favor on the part of one side. 
and so on until fighting stopped for a considerable period. This happened more than once in the trench warfare of World War I, over big stretches of the front and much to the dismay of the generals. Like other psychological tendencies, and also man's ability to turn somersaults, reciprocate favor tendency operates to a very considerable degree at a subconscious level. This helps make the tendency a strong force that can sometimes be used by some men to mislead others, which happens all the time. And we're going to uh, discuss a few examples in addition to that Monish Pabrai example of the pen, the gift of the pen that I just talked about. Uh, so this is talking about Cialdini and um, a, a test that he did, an experiment. So Cialdini, his practitioners wandered around the campus asking strangers to devote a big chunk of time every week for two years to the supervision of juvenile delinquents. This ridiculous request got him a 100% rejection rate, okay? But that wasn't the point. He was setting up the next ask. But the practitioner had a follow-up question. Will you at least spend one afternoon taking juvenile delinquents to a zoo? Okay, a one-off. This raised Cialdini's former acceptance rate of one in six to one in two, okay? tripling the acceptance rate. Uh, if, if you know people made a big ask that was pretty clear to get a no, and then they made a concession, right? They backed off on the asks and, and made a much smaller ask, dramatically increased um, the, the amount of time that people said yes. What Cialdini's compliance practitioners had done was make a small concession, which was reciprocated by a small concession from the other side. This subconscious reciprocation of a concession by Cialdini's experimental subjects actually caused a much increased percentage of them to end up irrationally agreeing to go to a zoo with juvenile delinquents. Uh, last section from the book that I want to talk about Overall, both inside and outside religions, it seems clear to me that reciprocation tendencies, constructive contributions to man far outweigh its destructive effects, right? It's such a core part of what makes us human, right? What makes us cooperate with each other as a species. Before we leave reciprocate favor tendency, the final phenomena we will consider is widespread human misery from feelings of guilt. To the extent the feeling of guilt has an evolutionary base, I believe the most plausible cause is the mental conflict triggered in one direction by reciprocate favor tendency and in the opposite direction by reward super response tendency pushing one to enjoy 100% of some good thing, okay? So a lot of the guilt we feel as humans can be traced back to not living up to this reciprocation tendency. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say from poor Charlie's Almanac. Let's jump into chat GPT real quick, and then we'll end on the Farnham Street blog post. Provide powerful examples of how reciprocation tendency can mislead people. Right? That's what we're trying to understand here. Reciprocation tendency is a powerful psychological principle that describes our natural inclination to respond to a positive action with another positive action. However, this tendency can also mislead people in various ways. Here are some powerful examples. I want to point out here the way that Monish Pabrai uses this by gifting a pen uh, with some introduction material on what Pabrai Funds is all about, uh, he sends a physical packet with a pen. Pabrai has said this reciprocation tendency, uh, it's not like for like, okay? It's, you know, we don't consider the scale of the gift when we aim to reciprocate, when, when someone has given us something. So that's why he can give a pen 
and get back these huge sums for his fund. So I've seen places where it says reciprocation tendency is really about reciprocating on a like for like basis. Uh, Pabrai thinks that there's a glitch there that we don't remember the size of the favor. We just remember, oh, I owe this person something. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, so let's see some powerful examples of how this tendency can mislead. Door in the face technique. This technique involves making an initial request that is so large that it is likely to be refused, right? You're likely to get the door slammed in your face because it's so large, like what we saw with Cialdini followed by a smaller, more reasonable request. The requester knows that the recipient will feel a sense of obligation to reciprocate after rejecting the first request, right? Making a concession from the big ask to the small ask. Uh, and this will increase the likelihood of the second request being accepted. This technique can mislead people into agreeing to things that they wouldn't have otherwise agreed to. The second, con artists. Con artists use reciprocation tendency to gain trust and exploit people. They often start by doing something small like offering a free gift or a compliment to create a sense of indebtedness. Once they have gained the victim's trust, uh, they will make larger requests or ask for money, knowing that the victim is more likely to comply due to the sense of obligation created by the initial positive action. Number three, charitable donations. Well, this one, the con artist one, reminds me of the Hare Krishnas, right? Giving a small gift and then asking for a donation. So there's a lot of overlap between number two and number three. Charitable donations. Charities often use the principle of reciprocation tendency to increase donations. For example, they might send out a small gift like a notepad or a pen knowing the recipient is more likely to feel obligated to donate in return. This reminds me when I get solicitations for donations and there's, you know, these kind of return stickers, right, with my name and address that I can use when I mail envelopes, right? That's a form of a, a small gift. Uh, however, this can mislead people into donating more than they can afford or to causes that they don't fully support. Again, that subconscious tendency to reciprocate. Gift giving. Reciprocation tendency can also mislead people in gift giving situations. When someone receives a gift, they feel obligated to reciprocate with a gift of similar value. Okay, not necessarily the case. However, this can lead to a cycle of reciprocal gift giving, where both parties are spending more money and time than they would like to. Number five, political campaigning. Politicians often use the principle of reciprocation tendency to gain support. For example, they might offer to do something for a voter, like provide them with a special service or sign a petition, knowing that the voter will be more likely to vote for them in return. This can mislead people into supporting a candidate who may not align with their values or beliefs. In summary, while reciprocation tendency can be a positive force for building relationships and social bonds, it can, also be mis it can also be used to mislead people into making decisions that are not in their best interest. Okay, last section here, Farnham Street. Uh, Farnham Street has gone very deep into mental models and these psychology of human misjudgment tendencies. Uh, and then here's a post on reciprocation bias. If you're like me, whenever receiving a favor, you too feel an immense need, almost an obligation to pay it back in kind. Uh, the archeologist Richard Leakey believes reciprocation is the foundation on which we have evolved. We are human because our ancestors learned to share their food and their skills in an honored network of obligation. Uh, so let's give some, some compelling examples here. Uh, so we already talked about Genghis Khan. 
we touched on this, but let's touch on it again. If the reciprocation rule is so overpowering, the natural question here would be, is there a way we can still control our response to it? Munger advises us to train our patients. The standard antidote to one's overactive hostility is to train oneself to defer reaction. Uh, Tom Murphy, you can always tell the man off tomorrow if it's such a good idea. Um, we talked about this. Love, you guys can read through. I highly, highly encourage everyone to read through these. I just want to touch on some. Here's one. Uh, Charlie Munger recalls how the eccentric hedge fund manager, Victor Niederhofer, managed to get good grades with an impressive course load when he was an undergrad student at Harvard. Contrary to what one may expect, Niederhofer was not a very hardworking student. Instead of studying, he liked spending his time playing world-class checkers, gambling in high-stakes card games, and playing amateur-level tennis and professional-level squash. So how did he manage to get those good grades? Munger explains. He thought he was up to outsmarting the Harvard economics department, and he was. He noticed that the graduate students did most of the boring work that would otherwise go to the professors. And he noticed that because it was so hard to get to be a graduate student at Harvard, they were all very brilliant and organized and hardworking, as well as much needed by grateful professors. And therefore, by custom, and as would be predicted from the psychological force called reciprocity tendency, in a really advanced graduate course, the professors always gave an A. So Victor Niederhofer signed up for nothing but the most advanced graduate courses in the Harvard Economics Department. And of course, he got A after A after A after A, and was hardly ever near a class. And for a while, some people at Harvard may have thought it had a new prodigy on its hands. That's a ridiculous story, but the scheme will work still. And Niederhofer is famous. Uh, they call his style Niederhofering the Curriculum. So, talks about smaller cases where a salesman offers us a cup of coffee with cookies we're likely to be subconsciously tricked into compliance by even such a minor favor. Uh, and that was the experience, or at least Sam Walton, founder of Walmart, noticed that. Uh, he wouldn't let Walmart's purchasing agents accept even a hot dog from a vendor, okay? Because he was aware of the subconscious pull of this reciprocation tendency. Uh, Munger talks about the reciprocation tendency uh, being responsible for some wicked pay dynamics in the boardroom of public companies. It's incredible the reciprocity that happens when CEOs keep recommending that directors get paid more and then the directors raise the CEO's pay. It's a big game of pity pat. And then they hire a compensation consultant to make sure no one else is getting paid more. This is true even if the CEO is a klutz and a little dishonorable. I think the existing system is very bad and my system would work better, but it's not going to happen. In order to prevent these dynamics, he suggests that the board of directors does not get paid at all. I think tons of eminent people would serve on boards of companies like Exxon without being paid. The lower courts in England are run by unpaid magistrates. And Harvard is run by boards of people who don't get paid. In fact, they have to pay in the form of donations to the school. I think boards would be better if they were run like Berkshire Hathaway's. Uh, oh, here's the concession by Robert Cialdini. This is a good one. Um, Besides the obvious doing of favors, there is a more subtle technique that may lure us into reciprocal and cooperative behavior. So here's the example. I was walking down the street when I was approached by an 11 or 12 year old boy. He introduced himself and said he was selling tickets to the annual Boy Scouts Circus to be held on the upcoming Saturday night. He asked if I wished to buy any tickets at $5 a piece. 
Since one of the last places I wanted to spend Saturday evening was with the Boy Scouts, I declined. Well, he said, if you don't want to buy any tickets, how about buying some of our chocolate bars? They're only $1 each. Cialdini automatically bought two chocolates and immediately realized that something was wrong. I knew that to be the case because A, I do not like chocolate bars. B, I do like dollars. C, I was standing there with two of his chocolate bars. And D, he was walking away with two of my dollars. Uh, after meeting with his research assistants and conducting experiments with a similar setup on his students, Cialdini arrived at a rule that explains this behavior. The person who acts in a certain way toward us is entitled to a similar return action. So the person who acts in a certain way toward us entitled to a similar return action. This rule has two consequences. One, we feel obliged to repay favors we have received. Two, we feel obliged to make a concession to someone who has made a concession to us. That is fascinating. Right? So this isn't like someone did us a favor, right? It's very direct. Someone does us a favor, we feel obliged to return the favor. This is somebody's making an ask, right? A big ask. It's easy to say no to that. Much harder to say no when they make a small ask after a big ask, right? They've made a concession from that initial big ask. We feel obligated to make a concession to that initial no, which, which is just fascinating to me. Um, let's see, is there anything else I wanted to cover? Um, one of the reasons reciprocation can be used so effectively as a device for gaining another's compliance is that it combines power and subtlety. Especially in its concessionary form, the reciprocation rule often produces a yes response to a request that otherwise would surely have been refused. I hope the next time you come across a situation where you feel the need to return a favor, you will think twice about the possible consequences of accepting it in the first place. You may think, for example, that someone offering you a free pen will not influence you at all but there is an entire human history arguing otherwise. Perhaps Sam Walton's policy of not accepting favors at all in matters where impartiality is preferred is best. So, you know, obviously a very powerful tendency and one that is often used, right? To, to get someone to do something that normally they would easily say no to. So well, one well worth studying. Uh, hope you enjoyed this one, guys. And that's all I've got. So I will see you in the next video. Take care.